and action. Topics to study when you're talking about the Civil War are varied, and there's tons and tons of things we can talk about. But usually, when you go to a battlefield and you try to interpret what happened uh, and figure out what made this battle so unique and different, we often look to the leadership, the generals, the guys who made the plans, executed the plans, and then reacted to what happened when those plans unfolded. In Franklin, we're no different. Here, we tell stories of General John Bell Hood and General Schofield and Jacob Cox. At the Battle of Franklin, we'll have six Confederate generals killed. Six more Confederate generals wounded and one captured. This is the single largest loss of general staff life of any battle of the entire Civil War on one side of the Army, and it all happened really in the first hour of this fighting. And we tell that fact to our guests to prove a point, but it generally doesn't go much further than that. So we hope with these videos to be able to tell at least part of the rest of their story. So I hope you'll join us as we, the interpreters of the Battle of Franklin Trust, take you around this battlefield and we'll tell you about their lives, their exploits, what brought them here to Franklin, and of course, we'll show you the spots where these six men met their fate and destiny here at the Battle of Franklin on November 30th, 1864. Now when the Confederate Army launched their attack from Winstead Hill, they started out in these long battle lines that stretched for over two miles. But as they approached these lines of defense, right, they got closer, they started to kind of bunch up a little bit. Specifically, this part of the battlefield was being attacked by John Brown's division. General John Brown had four brigades. Of those brigades was General Strahl's. So two brigades kind of got slid in front as the leading element that was going to make kind of the first wave attack here. And then two more brigades were kind of slid in back of them to be that second wave to hit it. So by the time General Strahl's brigade got to these works, they were on that kind of second wave that hit this position. This gravel line marks the exact location of the U.S. line of defense uh, through this section of the property. Now those two brigades that had been snuck out in front to make that first line attack here, when they hit this section of the line, they would actually pierce a giant hole in the middle of it. They bounded over these works into the Carter Yard, and then for the next little bit, we have really some of the worst hand-to-hand -hand fighting of the entire Civil War swirling all around this house and these fields. Now, if you remember, Strahl's brigade was part of that second wave. They're still a little bit to the south trying to catch up. So by the time they reached these works, the Confederate troops who had broken through this position had already been mostly repulsed. They had been bought hand to hand, they pushed back, and now they occupy this trench, this ditch. So what previously had been a US position with all the soldiers along this line all firing to the south, was now a Confederate position. So these troops had now occupied this space and they're firing to the north shooting at the U.S. soldiers who were entrenched on that secondary line and really all the troops out in this position. So to put these works into perspective, what we have here is the U.S. trench, right? And I'm in the position of the U.S. soldier facing south. And this morning when they were building these works, we know archaeological evidence suggests that they had dug about 18 to 20 inches deep. They had taken the dirt that they had excavated and they built a parapet in front of these works. So they're not only 18 to 20 inches down, but they also have a giant earth mound in front of them that can stop bullets. Additionally, on top of these works, they had laid headlogs, wood that was meant to protect them and would leave a little gap for them to shoot through, and that log would protect their head while they were firing through that gap. And as they did so, what this means is that on the other side of this trench, there's now a ditch forming, and we also believe that maybe they had excavated additional dirt. We know that along this section of the line, we have really a, a very tall wall of dirt on the other side here, so high that they were saying they were having to hoist soldiers up and over the works in some spots. So this is the U.S. line. The Confederate soldiers along that first wave, they hit it here, they pierce through, the U.S. soldiers retreat to the north, the Confederates in hot pursuit. Now we have this hand-to-hand -hand action that's occurring in this yard. The Confederates that are fighting here are now pushed back. They are now repulsed. They are retreating back to the safety of this line of works. About this time, Strahl's men are getting up here as well. So now, remember along this trench, we have this giant mound of dirt right here. This is where the Confederate soldiers are now hunkering down behind this, this wall of dirt, what we call a ditch. And in this ditch, the Confederate soldiers are reloading and firing to the north, uh, the US soldiers that are entrenched now along the secondary line and reforming and regrouping. So to understand the death of General Strahl, that's really the perspective that's gonna give you the most understanding of it, right? He's behind these trenches, behind that earth and berm, he's taking cover and he's firing north into really what, what we call this, this no man's land. Because 50 yards to the north, our U.S. troops entrenched along the secondary line of defense. We had two parallel lines of defense here. The main line, which has been pierced, and the secondary line just about 50 yards up. All right, so we have this strange no man's land in between. Now the exact location of where General Strahl was when he was first wounded will never be known exactly, but based on all the accounts that we have, we suspect he's about this part of the line right here where it starts to bend back around. There was one account of Strahl while he was down here reloading rifles for his men, and he actually hoisted up soldiers up onto the works to fire. And there was one soldier who hoisted up, got shot and killed. 
The second hoisted up, got shot and killed, and the third boy came up to him and said, hoist me up, General. And he said, no, I have helped my last man up onto the works to be shot in my hands. In some of General Strahl's final moments on Earth along this line of defense, he was interacting with a sergeant by the name of Sergeant Cunningham. Now, Sergeant Cunningham would later write that he remembers fighting until this ditch was almost full of dead men. He said that there were so many corpses here that there was no standing room for the living. At one point during the fight, he was looking up and down this line, Sergeant Cunningham was, and he asked General Strahl, he just said, what do we do? He said that he can hardly find anyone along this line who can still fight. And General Otho Strahl, his only command was just keep firing, keep firing, keep firing. Now there's a multitude of reasons why I think this would have been one of the worst parts on the battlefield to be if you were a Confederate soldier that day. One of the most important reasons is something we haven't talked about yet. This line, this U.S. line, extends across Columbia Pike onto the other side of the road and turns to the south. Now, that section of the U.S. line was also broken through. The problem was, is that across the street, the U.S. troops were able to retake that section of the line. And right here, where General Strahl's men were, they never did. So the Confederates occupied this trench, but across the street, that line had been retaken. And since it's to the south just a little bit, they're able to turn their rifles and their cannon and shoot at General Strahl's men, where they have absolutely no cover. They've turned up, they're fighting what we call enfilade fire along the long axis of these Confederate troops, and they're cutting them to shreds. Now it's at this point and near this exact spot where General Strahl takes his first wound. He is struck by a bullet in the neck, presumably from across the street. It is a grievous wound, but he's still awake, still alert. He crawls, finds a second in command, relieves himself of his command uh, to him, and starts to remove himself from the battlefield. Now three guys pick him up and they start to carry him away. As they stand up and they carry away with him, they come under a tremendous amount of fire. Right? They let him down, wait for the fire to die down a second, then they pick back up and off they go. And when they go, General Strahl is struck by a bullet in the head and he dies on sight immediately during his evacuation. Strahl's body is then carried over to Carnton. If you're familiar with the story of the dead generals being laid out of Carnton, General Strahl was one of them. Shortly thereafter, his body is going to be taken down to Columbia and he's going to be buried at St. John's. He's going to stay there for some time before eventually he is disinterred and he is moved back to Dyersburg, Tennessee, where he currently rests today. Dyersburg is his adopted home because he's not actually from Tennessee. He's from Ohio. He was born and raised there. After studying for a couple of years at Ohio Wesleyan University, he decides to be the first member of his family to break away from a life of farming and he moves down to West Tennessee here to study law. Why he chooses to move all the way down here and study law we don't know for sure. What we do know is that in 1855 he did move here and in 1858 he was admitted to the bar and started his law practice here in Dyersburg. When Tennessee secedes from the Union, Strahl is now faced with a decision. Does he go back to his native state of Ohio and fight for the U.S. or does he side with the Confederacy? Well at this point he's been here for several years. He decides he's all in for the Confederacy. He decides to raise a company of infantry right here in Dyersburg sets him on a course for war. Now a lot of famous Civil War generals had prior military experience or West Point graduates, but sometimes when companies were being mustered, just being a good leader was enough. A lot of them didn't have military experience and Otho Strahl is a really good example of that. He'd never been in the military, but he was educated, he was a lawyer, people respected him, they said he was a great speaker, and he was able to raise this company and be its leader, even though he had never been in the military before. When the time came to test those leadership skills under fire, Strahl performed extremely well. Battle after battle, he fought at Shiloh, he bought it Perryville. Uh, he was at Stones River, Murfreesboro, Chattanooga, Chickamauga, all through the Atlanta campaign. Uh, he received promotion after promotion uh, and then was eventually promoted to Brigadier General after a lot of very high ranking people went to bat for him and sent letters to Jefferson Davis saying, hey, promote this man to Brigadier General. Before the Battle of Franklin began, they said that General Straw really didn't say much. They said he was pretty stone-faced and, and honestly looked very sad. He is quoted though as saying, boys, this will be short but desperate. One of the more famous quotes you'll hear about the Battle of Franklin, he knew that it would be short and desperate. He gave his prized horse away, decided not to ride it into battle, and then he was killed, as we know, on November 30th, 1864 on that battlefield. And here are General Strahl's remains. Dyersburg is a quaint little town. If you're a taphophile, if you're a person who likes going to cemeteries like I do, there is plenty to see here besides just General Strahl's grave. And I encourage you to do that. Go out, see history, enjoy it, learn, and learn from it. And thank you so much for joining me on this journey of Otho Strahl's life. And I hope you watch as we go through the rest of the other generals who died at the Battle of Franklin.